Okay, welcome to the new YouTube channel of the Institute of Space Systems and the German Sophia Institute of the University of Stuttgart. And very welcome to our very first live event. Behind the camera, there is my colleague Matthias Lange. He is the head of the public outreach of the IRS at the University of Stuttgart and myself, I am Dr. Mielert. I am the head of the educational and public outreach of the German Sophia Institute. Today we are at Dorfhammer Technik in Hamburg and we are giving you a tour through Sophia, the strength stereotype of the current job. After this live tour, of course, the video will be online on our YouTube channel. And moreover, we are of course very happy to get comments on their slide tour, questions, likes, whatever. We try to answer a few of your questions during the tour and we will try to give our best to answer all the other questions. With us, there is my colleague Michael Hugo, who is approaching us right now. So Michael, would you shortly introduce Hi, yourself Dörte. and Sophia to us? Yes, I would like to do so. My name is Michael Hugo. I'm also an employee of the Institute of uh, Space Systems. Okay, I can keep yeah, it. Okay. Yeah. I'm also an employee of the Institute of Space Systems at the University of Stuttgart, and I'm in charge of the DSI team in Palmdale, California, where Sophia is located and stationed, basically. And on top of that, I'm responsible to keep the telescope on board of this aircraft up and running. Sounds great. And why are you here in, at Lufthansa in Hamburg right now? So at the moment, uh, the, the so-called seat check for the aircraft is, is um, being performed, which is due every three years. And we will also use, or we have all also used this time slot to uh, perform a lot of different maintenance tasks on the telescope, on all the systems of the telescope, the optics, the electronical systems, the mechanical systems. Uh, and that was uh, what we have done during the past four months, basically. Okay, and can you comment a little bit on the partnerships? Who's involved in this project? The partnership between... Oh, for Sophia. The partnership for Sophia, of course, yes. The Sophia is a German and US bilateral research project. And the project, project carriers, basically, are the two uh, space agencies, so NASA on the US side and DLR on the German side. And the split of the project is 80 to 20, so that means um, NASA is bearing 80% of the cost and the German side is bearing 20% of the cost. And accordingly, the science result and the science time that this observatory can provide is split according to that uh, ratio of 80 to 20. Okay, that sounds great. And what was the kind of contribution of Germany or DLR and DSI to build the observatory? The observatory is built on board of a 747 SP aircraft and the German contribution and the German 20%, if you will, is the telescope. So the development of the telescope, the manufacturing of the telescope, but also the main maintenance of the telescope, the further development and improvement of the telescope and the day-to-day -day operation. That is the German contribution to the overall project. Okay. And how many people are you over there at the, in, in, in Palmdale? In California? the U.S. we have two sites in the U.S. The larger one is in Palmdale and uh, the, uh, Palmdale has approximately 25 uh, German engineers and technicians on site and uh, in addition to that we have another site up at Ames in the Bay Area and there we have approximately five to six more people uh, being involved in the operations. Okay, sounds very interesting. So maybe now it's time to enter the aircraft itself and look what it's inside. Of course. Maybe you go ahead. Halt's auch an sein und dann die Fragen bei dir auch okay. in deinem Mund. Okay. Ja, ein bisschen näher ranhalten. 
Ja, okay. Die fragen wir dir dann auch. Okay, so, what do we see? I mean, here it's looking very similar to a normal aircraft. <laughs> yes, the, the seat row, what you see here on the, on the left, uh, right hand side of the aircraft, this is, uh, looks pretty straightforward as, an, as what you know from a regular airliner. However, um, these uh, 10 to 12 seats are basically uh, the business class as it was built in 1977. But I think that's the only regular part of this aircraft that you can see. Okay, so now we are very keen on seeing the other parts. <laughs> okay, so what you see here on the left hand side is already a big chunk of the electronics that you have on board the aircraft and this electronics is used to control the telescope as well as to acquire all the data that you can see uh, on the sky during the observations. Okay. And this is basically the main cabin of the aircraft and this has nothing at all to do with what you can see in a regular airline. True. <laughs> That's very true. So let me uh, let me walk you around and go through the different uh, the various stations that we have here. And uh, already the first station here <coughs> is the so-called EPO console, and that is something very unique to this project. E EPO stands for Education and Public Outreach, and this is a uh, firm part of the project that teachers from the US as well as from Germany can participate uh, to science fly flights and that they are basically part of the team for two flights. They have the opportunity to see on the screens what the scientists in front of the cabin can also see and the purpose of the whole exercise is to motivate young people to put their interest and their studies into science, mathematics, physics and such things. Okay, sounds exciting. So the next station here is the so-called mission director's station. We have two of them. And the mission director in a NASA mission basically is the guy running the show. And this is the person that orchestrates all the activities. He communicates to the flight deck as well as to the scientists which are sitting right in front of him or her here on the next station. All the communication, the various activities, the orchestration of the entire uh, project program, the uh, entire mission during that particular day. This is run by the mission director. So he controls basically everything. Okay. And then we have two different positions here. In the first row, these two, uh, three seats here belong to the so-called uh, science instrument operators. And these people are controlling and steering the instrument, the science instrument that is conducting the science and the observation on that particular flight. We have a set of six instruments uh, flying on SOFIA currently. Each instrument is different, has different purpose in terms of science. Uh, <coughs> uh, but it is controlled from here and sits on the telescope right in the middle of the aircraft, which we will see in a few moments. On the left hand side, we have two seats for the so-called telescope operators and the telescope operators have the task to really operate and control the telescope. So these are the persons who really acquire the star in the, in the, in the picture, um, set, set the telescope and point the telescope into the right direction uh, of the astronomical object that's going to be observed and then they will hand over to the uh, science instrument operators and they will then do the acquisition of the data. Okay. And you said that there's uh, 
You said that there are six instruments available for this telescope. Um, are they all from Germany or all from the US? So this is quite a mixed bag. Some of the, the instruments are developed by uh, uh, by, uh, from the US side, by US institutions, univer universities and such, and uh, the other three are developed from German institutes, one at the University of Stuttgart, the other one uh, at the University of Cologne and the Max Planck Institute, and the third one is really developed by DSI. This is a so-called focal plane imager, which is always on the aircraft and always flying with us, and this is a development from DSI itself. Okay, sounds great. So now we go right to the front of the cabin. And what you can see, or see here, again on the left side, is a lot of electronics controlling the, the telescope. And here you can see the telescope itself, and the gray ring structure around the fuselage of the aircraft is the so-called bulkhead which, uh, which separates the cabin from the non-pressurized cavity where the telescope sits and everything that is blue right here this is the telescope itself okay we don't have an instrument on the telescope at the moment but where this silverish mass dummy sits right now that's the place where the instruments gonna be installed and why <laughs> and why do you have this mass dummy on there because you don't have I mean could you just let um, it get free you, you can think of the telescope as a big dumbbell basically on the one side in the cavity you have the optics and here you have other instrumentation and uh, entities of the telescope and the whole, uh, whole uh, thing sits on a spherical bearing right in the middle of the bulkhead and it has to be in perfect, perfect balance all the time. And that's why you have to install a mass dummy here on that side, even when there's no instrument on the telescope. Okay. And <laughs> thank you very much, Michael, for this My great introduction. introduction. And over here, I... I think we need Nadine. Maybe you would like to introduce yourself. Put the microphone to this. This is why you have to yeah. So, <laughs> hello everybody. My name is Nadine Fischer. I'm a software engineer at the German Sophia Institute. So my background is actually in uh, mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. I have a German diploma, something like a master's degree in there. After my university education, I was at the automotive industry for seven years kind of transitioning between mechanical and engineering to the software so I was developing functionalities how to properly control a diesel engine mm -hmm. and then I thought ah, why not apply for Sophia for a Sophia job get an open position as a software developer and so that's what I did um, now I'm here so and I'm glad I did it's a pretty cool job <laughs> so and what's your purpose when you're working on Sophia and Renault I'm what are you doing? What's your task? So, um, I'm a software engineer, so we develop and test and install all the softwares from controlling the position of the telescope to evaluating the pictures and the, the, in the visual light, not the scientific pictures, that's what the scientists do. Um, but to know where the telescope looks at, we also have three cameras in the visible light, and then there's a software behind that that evaluates the brightest point on the picture and then there it, it sends some uh, control corrections to the motors that point the telescope where to look at so yeah okay and did you do some maintenance work here at the telescope during the stay at Lufthansa Mechanik as well uh, yes we did we installed a lot of, a lot of new features uh, one of the new features is also an improved controller, so as you can imagine, if an airplane is flying, there's a lot of disturbances, there are um, turbulences, there's vibrations from the aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, the telescope itself uh, has a specific weight uh, and dimension, and depending on, as Michael said, it's a dumper, so it bends. That all has to be uh, taken in consideration, and we have a big team 
that uh, evaluates or thinks of new functionalities to improve uh, the picture stability. Um, so from time to time, we also take measurements in flight as a team, mm -hmm. evaluate them, try out different parameters of the controllers, and after all the data acquisition and, and uh, evaluation, we decide which parameters we actually want to use, and then we install them. So okay. from now on, the picture should be a little more stable, even now. Okay, sounds great. And um, probably you flew on Sophia, so how often do you usually fly on Sophia? Um, I'm not flying regularly, so basically on demand. Usually if we install bigger changes, one of our teams flies to make sure um, that everything works as expected. Um, usually some of our team though prepares the telescope on a flight day. That's the other part of my job and it's a big part, an important part. Mm -hmm. So depending on the takeoff time, we come a few hours earlier, switch on the telescope, do a little, uh, some small checkouts if everything is working as it should be. If not, we call for help. <laughs> so whoever is, uh, we have also always a dedicated set of people here, engineers and mechanics, avionics, technicians, and then we try to troubleshoot so that the, air, uh, the, the plane can take off on time and take the data. It is very important that we take off on time because mm -hmm. um, the objects on the sky can only sometimes are only be visible at that specific point in time where it should be there, mm -hmm. I mean, where the plane should look at it. So if sometimes if we take off only 10 minutes too late, the whole flight might be gone because the objects we want to observe cannot be seen anymore. So yeah, it's very important that we take off on time. Yeah, that sounds really <laughs> challenging. Yeah, also, <laughs> if, if something goes wrong in flight, the person who does the so-called startup during the day will be on call for the night. Okay. So it might be that they call us at 3 a.m. in the morning because we fly at night. So okay. Of course, for kind of known problems, we have special set of instructions on the aircraft the, that the telescope operators can perform. But as you know, not always the th same things break. So that if they can't help themselves anymore, we will help them if we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Michael mentioned that usually your team is uh, located in Palmdale. So you also, you live in Palmdale in California? Yes, I live in Palmdale in California. I moved there in August 2015. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's different. It's nice. It's its advantages and disadvantages. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. But now you are here during the you were here during the whole check of Sophia. And yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, I've been here since the day Sophia arrived because I was on the aircraft when it arrived. So ah. I flew here from uh, Palmdale to Hamburg. Mm -hmm. uh, with a little break, I've been here most of the time. For example, over Christmas and New Year's, I was back at my hometown in southern Germany. But since then, I've been here all the time. Okay. Thank you so much for so all this great information and hope you will have a nice time still here in Germany. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. So we may move forward again, and so this is a little nicer. You may ask, why do you do this effort? Why do you put in a telescope into an aircraft, but not put it on the ground like usually telescopes would be situated on? And the answer is that with Sophia is we are doing infrared astronomy. We want to catch the infrared light, the infrared information of the universe. And the bad thing is that even if there is blue sky or clear nights, that we will have water vapor above us. And this water vapor prevents this infrared information to come down here on ground. Because this water vapor will either scatter, absorb, or reflect this infrared light, so we won't see it. Then you could ask, why do we need to have this infrared information doesn't it, isn't it, might, might it be enough to have, just have the visible information of the uh, object in the sky? And here the answer again is no, it's not enough, because I will show you a little example. Give me a second. You probably, so now you <laughs> try to catch this, you probably know this constellation. This is Ori the Orion constellation. 
And this is something probably everybody who's living on the Northern Hemisphere once has seen with his or her own eyes. That's the Orion constellation in the visible light. If we had eyes that would be sensible in the mid-infrared, then what you would see would be this on the right side of this image, so this red stuff. Um, so it's exactly the same area in the sky, but it's what you would see in the mid-infrared. So in all the bright spots are star formation regions. So it looks very different, and you see that there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of star formation is going on in there. And this is one of the major topics of the scientific topics Sophia is doing. We are investigating uh, star formation, how star forms, how many of which mass, and what is the time scale that they would develop, and what is the time scale and the processes that produce the chemical elements we all know here on Earth in the stars. Um, so star formation is one of the big issues, as I said, and up here in the Sophia aircraft you see some um, examples on science Sophia did, and for example we did the we investigated the galactic center where there is one of the biggest or the, the most active star formation region in our own galaxy. So that's what we invested, investigated with Sophia because these star formation regions usually produce a lot of infrared light and information. And that's what we can only detect with Sophia right now. Another uh, example for star formation is what you can see here in a star formation region which is called W3. Sometimes the astronomical objects have very weird names, but that's one of the things we usually investigate, or one of the main things we investigate with Sophia. Also, Sophia um, can detect various molecules in the universe. Um, many, for, uh, for example, molecules that are important for um, for developing life. For example, a while ago we published a detection of water molecules on the moon's surface at locations on the moon where the sun is shining on, so where we wouldn't expect to find water, because we would expect to evaporate it, uh, but it's still there. So and this is very exciting for all space missions, if there's more water on the moon than we thought before, that's very exciting. Moreover, there's uh, some other muon molecule. Sophia detected uh, cosmologists uh, think they have the idea that the very, very first molecule in the universe that ever had been formed is the so-called helium hydride molecule, which is just a helium atom, atom with a uh, ionized hydrogen uh, atom, which is just a proton. And this is what we, well, cosmologists think is the very first molecule that ever has formed very shortly after the Big Bang. But this molecule was never detected until a few years ago, I think 2017, Sophia detected this molecule with kind of a emission at a very particular infrared emission line. And so now they, cosmologists can be safe that their kind of theory is not quite wrong. It could still be true. So this is very important for those people. So I think now we are um, hopefully done here on the main deck, as we call this. And since we are in a, in a 747 SB, but it's still a 747, you may know that the cockpit of those aircraft is upstairs. And that's why we are going upstairs right now. Sorry, I'm running in circles. <laughs> and <laughs> Matthias has to follow me. <laughs> so here's the stairs. We are going upstairs and hope that we are going to meet one of the pilot crew members. Have a very good morning. just the back part of this upper deck and now we are approaching the cockpit and Hello. hi <laughs> so do you do you want to sit there yeah i probably i probably did the 
microphone for you. Sure. Have if it you'd like to sit here, there. That's fine too. Okay. Thank you. So. Hello. Annie. Everybody. <laughs> Greg, you're here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> It's very quite narrow in here, so would you please introduce yourself and what That's you're doing on Sophia? <laughs> absolutely. Uh, my name is uh, Andy Berry. I'm the chief pilot uh, for the Sophia project at NASA. Uh, I've been on board, uh, I've been with NASA for uh, just about four years now. I've been with Sophia for about three years. Uh, I've got a background, uh, pretty diverse, uh, but uh, as do most of our pilots, uh, come from the U.S. military program. Uh, I'm a Navy pilot, a number of folks are from Air Force, uh, lots of people with uh, strong test backgrounds uh, and such. Uh, I uh, flew commercial in the States as well. Uh, when I got out, uh, I was a little bored by it and was looking for a little more excitement in life, and NASA definitely provides that uh, okay. to all of us. So uh, I've, I'm also, uh, as do many of our pilots, fly multiple aircraft. Uh, back in uh, at Edwards and Armstrong, mm -hmm. and so I'm also the lead pilot on our Gulfstream fleet. We've got about three uh, Gulfstream threes that we fly in various condition of uh, modification with different instrumentation and uh, airborne science uh, support projects that we do there as well, similar to what DLR does with mm -hmm. uh, some of their aircraft mm -hmm. fleet. So, and that's it. me in a, a s small nutshell. <laughs> okay. And, I mean, flying on Sophia, I mean, I heard that astronomers are observing the telescope when they open up the door up yes. there, which is very weird. <laughs> so do you recognize when they, the door is going to be opened? One of the most popular questions uh, for the pilots <laughs> is, what's it like with a big hole in the back of your plane? And honestly, the engineering work that uh, went into this is uh, astounding, uh, as you can see from the outside and the pictures with uh, the gaping hole. Uh, it is uh, the only thing we recognize in the aircraft uh, once they say the door is open is we have a little green light on the panel behind you that says door open. Okay. And uh, it's very, it's uh, and there's a, you, a little bit of flight characteristic difference where we do have to do a little bit of rudder trim, but very, very little. It's maybe, it impacts the aircraft heading maybe a half a degree. Okay. Uh, but we feel nothing. It's, there's no rough air or anything like that. And it's always astounding to see that engineering work okay. that was done uh, and, and going down stairs when we are flying when we know we can barely hold a cup of coffee <laughs> and you and the aircraft is tracking uh, an object with such fine fidelity mm -hmm. and the you see the entire air uh, the entire telescope assembly bouncing off the edges of the aircraft and knowing that it's actually you that's moving it's so stable that it's locked on target it's just incredible okay okay so you, you mentioned this uh panels over there so this cockpit looks a little different than other cockpits look like yeah so, so tell us a little bit about this yeah so as you see there's a third seat in the middle and mm -hmm. we're able to well this aircraft is a little older vintage uh than many of the modern aircraft that you see that you fly on and uh, so this is the flight engineer. This is, uh, I might have just unplugged you. I'm back on. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, so yeah, the, uh, we have a third uh, crew member on board who uh, maintains all, all of these switches and dials and everything that's very intimidating at a glance. And it is. Uh, uh, there's quite a bit to do here. We are, uh, uh, thankfully, uh, they're monitoring all the different systems on the aircraft that modern aircraft have mm -hmm. automation that do that for them. So. They're monitoring everything from the pressurization systems to the fuel and transferring fuel in between tanks where we need to, and you know, uh, keeping the you know the telescope with the temperatures we need on the oil for the bearing to be floated and that sort of thing. So, there it's a constant uh, interaction with both uh, monitoring aircraft systems, working with the crew downstairs uh, throughout the flight, um, and it, and we're thankful to that uh, because you know we're flying so late at night all the time. And you know it keeps us engaged uh, to, <laughs> to to deal with the mission directors and the telescope operators and to help keep the aircraft on target. Um, you know we're flying on the autopilot while we're flying the missions just because the fatigue and the precision that it can do as well that we don't have to worry about just staring at the gauges and mm -hmm. uh, keeping the plane upright. Um, so it, uh, we do rely on that, which helps greatly over a 10-hour mission, uh, as you can imagine. But the constant interaction with the crew downstairs is great, and you know it's often very just a slow, steady turn we're doing through the night, like over 
you know, at 2,000 kilometers and just doing three degrees across that, you know, few hour profile that mm -hmm. we're doing. And then we'll do a reversal to get onto a different target. And, you know, you look at the chart of our map that we're flying over and it's just a big spaghetti chart of uh, all <laughs> over the place. But, uh, you know, we're looking at, tar you know, eight, nine different targets in one night sometimes. And uh, whether it's a galaxy or a star or the moon, mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so it's uh, it's always exciting. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, since you said that you are interacting with the team downstairs, so yeah. was there one kind of particular very exciting um, observations you were kind of involved, where you had to have keep on tracking very spe precisely, or is this exciting? And how did you get feedback on yeah, yeah, yeah. on your job? <laughs> yeah. So um, all, everything we're doing is precise flying. So there's a couple different opportunities that we do. Uh, you know, one that I was personally involved in, um, most observations that we do, we get briefed what we're looking at that night and we, we have a big science packet of what we mm -hmm. can do to also help keep us awake and read up on <laughs> while we're flying. And uh, it'll give us uh, an idea, oftentimes the ground controllers are like, what are you looking, what are you looking at tonight? And it's very, it's fun to talk to them and they get excited and, mm -hmm. and share like we are here. And they, uh, uh, about uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, like, so we don't always know the value of what the target that we're looking at. We know we have an idea, but it takes so many years to disprove the, the peer reviews and the process of the science mm -hmm. publication is, is really involved. Um, and about two and a half years ago, we were flying uh, in August of uh, 2018. Uh, we did a an odd. Usually, we're looking at things that are you know millions of light years away and uh, such uh, and we looked at something that's up in our sky every night that everyone knows being the moon mm -hmm. uh, at the very end is a new idea uh, where we had our, our forecast instrument on and they were looking for water on the moon and they had mentioned that and as I got caught my ear is something very unique mm -hmm. and uh, my colleague and I that were flying and we had talked to the principal investigator that was on that night and she was from Hawaii was very excited and had this idea that she might was hoping crossing her fingers that it would work and you know, it was, it was kind of neat to actually hear a little like hey, downstairs at the end of the flight because you know, like, they actually <laughs> rarely have that and as many people know that has been breaking news in the last few months mm -hmm. with NASA announcing that discovery that they did find indeed and confirmed what a lot of people hypothesized was there and so that was just really neat to be a part of um, and oftentimes like some of the other interactions we do some unique flying where we do what we call occultations or eclipses effectively mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from far off stars and uh, where we're chasing a shadow across a, a remote section of ocean or whatever we're looking at to get an observation and that's very precise flying there where we're coordinating with downstairs with we have a navigator on board that's fi helping us fine tune it where we have to be we're chasing a shadow that's moving tens of thousands of miles an hour across wow. and we need to mm -hmm. intercept it and within you know we're, we're hoping within like, usually we're hitting waypoints along our flight path our target is within two minutes we're really we're trying to be within seconds and it, it's really neat to fall back on some of that military training and, and crew mm -hmm. coordination that we do with the folks downstairs to work together to hit these targets and oftentimes we've done about six or seven of these flights like that where we have when they have reduced the data after and looked at it they're like you are within a half a wingspan and half a second mm -hmm. of hitting a target where you needed to be so i'll accept that error <laughs> okay. Okay. so yeah. it's neat so and why are you in Hamburger now? We just learned that the t uh, aircraft and the telescope both were maintenance here. So what, yeah. what is your job and duty here in Hamburg right now? Yeah, I, I have not seen this plane cleaner before. Uh, right <laughs> oh, okay. now. First off, it's shiny. It's a 1976 vintage, if you didn't know that. And it, it looks brand new right now. So it's very exciting to uh, to see that. But yes, uh, Lufthansa Technique is our partner here uh, for a uh, three-year maintenance period that we're doing. And so uh, myself, uh, another pilot, and we have, uh, as mentioned, uh, we have mm -hmm. a handful of, uh, we have a couple flight engineers. Uh, we have to do a, this oh. manual here, this 243-page <laughs> manual of checks on all those dials and switches back there and up here and everything that they worked on 
we have to verify before we say it's safe for the science to happen mm -hmm. we have to make sure everything works and is safe for flight so that's our primary purpose is just to do a full shakedown of the aircraft to make sure everything is functional and proper and before we sign off on the uh, receipt if you would mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, Lufthansa can fix anything that may not work the yeah. way we okay. it's supposed mm -hmm. to so uh, it's a uh, and we do this about every few years and so uh, we've been here previously and we'll uh, be flying uh, later this week uh, start doing ground checks and some flights and uh, cross our fingers and toes and uh, everything will work so. out yeah yeah <laughs> Okay, that sounds very exciting. Yes. So then we keep our fingers crossed yes. that all these tests might went well, well, might go well, well. Yes. And Sophia will be on track for our next science yes. pretty soon. So this was our live tour through Sophia. If you need to have any more information, visit our homepage of the DSI or from the Sophia Mission Operations Center. If you have some more questions, we will go and check them. Are there some actual questions which you might go and answer? Okay, then we will go and look into the chat afterwards. And that's it for now. See you on this channel soon. Bye. Okay.